Welcome to the next questions video. And this video is special because not only do I deal with how I answer questions every morning, but I have a customer that over a period of three years was uh, hybridizing uh, guppies and mollies and was videotaping each stage of the process and sending me a lot of the clips. Uh, and so I had this large collection of clips of what he'd been doing um, and each one came attached to an email explaining what the clip was about. So I went through all of that and put together a section today on his three-year program of developing these guppy molly hybrids. So that's in today's video. So I hope that you enjoy it. Since the last video, I did a section, uh, in that video I did a section on shipping, and I had a couple of people contact me since that video was done, including a company that is, uh, we're, we're working on, they're taking me on uh, to share shipping with them so that we would both benefit from the lower rates due to our, due to our volume. So we're working on that. Um, I've got uh, meetings about that actually this coming week, and hopefully I will post everything on my homepage as to what's going on, but hopefully I'll have shipping, uh, a new way of shipping here over the next week or two, and my, the shipping costs quoted in that first video should be cut in about half. So that's what we're working toward, and uh, so I am working on it, and I will keep uh, information up on the homepage at selectaquatics.com, um, and hopefully we'll start shipping fish on a regular basis again. But it's been pretty chilly, so we had a couple weeks here with temperatures uh, below zero for quite a while, and uh, hopefully it'll start to warm up soon, and we'll start getting fish out to you again. So I hope you enjoy this video, and again, if you have any questions or things you'd like to see covered, please email me. And I'd love to talk to you. In the last video, I admit that I gave short shrift to the to the uh, question that I was dealing with, but uh, her question was quite involved and and uh, was actually multifaceted. There were a number of different issues in it, but I felt it was a good setup for what I did in the last video. And in this one, I'd like to go ahead and we'll look at it a little closer. If you remember, she starts off by saying, "I'm desperate for some help and advice." Everyone tells me different stuff, so I'm just grasping at straws here, and I need something to cure my tank. Over the last five months, I've tried API General Cure, salt, heat, medicated metro, metro prosy food, and recently three weeks of prosy Pro, hoping to eradicate the cycle. I also called fish that I knew were affected and to try to stop this. Then she writes, my fish don't act sick, but, uh, don't act sick, but every few days I'll see stringy poop. Milky, clear looking, not necessarily like a clear piece of string, but not normal, stringy. I decided Metroplex since it was e easily located locally and cheaper. However, I'm closing out on two weeks of treatment and still seeing stringy and or white poo. It's not, now I gotta admit something. When I started writing, uh, answering questions to people who would write me in the morning, which is great, I enjoy doing that, it's the best part of my day. But when I first started doing this, I had a lot of people writing me describing what their fish's poop looked like. And I thought that was really kind of odd. It's not something I've ever thought about or was ever concerned about myself. People say that, or I've told people that I learn as much from these emails as, uh, as, they, as they learn from anything I can share with them. And it's been interesting to me how often this topic comes up. But anyway, she writes, it's not constant. It seems to come and go. But here's the kicker. They all act and look fine. No sunken bellies, no strange behavior. They are eating and swimming around just fine. Colors are vibrant. I'm at the point now that the only thing I have not tried is the levamisole for the poop. But I guess my question at this point is if I should be medicating fish that act otherwise totally fine, but just have one symptom of stringy white poop. Is it possible this is just their new normal? I hate to medicate again if it's not necessary, but at the same time, I want to know that my tank is free of any diseases or issues, so at some point I could add new fish. I've been at a standstill for five months now. I've been suspecting that I have eggs living something somewhere in the tank and the substrate or the filter, hence three weeks of ProsyPro hoping to eradicate the life cycle of this parasite. This ended last Friday. I did a very deep clean of the tank. Okay, so she goes on. So when I get a question like that from someone, the first things I want to know is I want to get an idea of the environment. So I'll ask them, you know, what's your pH, what's your hardness, what temperature do you keep them at, and what is your water change schedule? Then I want to get an idea of how clean the environment is and how well they take care of their tank. So I'll ask, how thick of a substrate do you use? 
what type of filtration do you use and how thick is, and how often do you vacuum the substrate. And then I want to get an idea of, of, of whether the tank is just appropriate otherwise. So I'll ask, you know, what size tank, how many fish are in it, uh, and uh, do you have any problems with any other fish. So then she writes back, thanks for replying to, uh, thanks for replying. To answer your questions, yes, they are eating. I feed omega-1 freshwater flakes, except for the times that I feed medicated food. Sometimes I'll throw in a Hakari sinking wafer. I feed once a day, if that. Sometimes I skip entirely. Also, sometimes I've given deshelled peas. Most of them have deteriorated slowly over time and not eaten. A couple I have ended up having to just euthanize because they get so bad they are getting picked on by other fish because they're just laying on the bottom. We have very hard water here, always around 8.0. It's a 20-gallon tank, and I'm running an Aquion 30. Uh, since I do not have a planted tank, I do water changes weekly. At one point, I was slightly overstocked, but never had issues with nitrates getting out of hand. I usually do about a 50% weekly water change every Friday. Last night, I did decide to pull out all of the substrate. I was fed up, so now I have a bare-bottom tank which should be easier to treat for now. I just need to know what path to take when treating. The poop is stringy, can sometimes milky colored, segmented at times too, and sometimes I will see stringy, and she goes on about the poop. So when I look at those that, that information, and we're talking about live bears, my understanding is that, 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 that we're talking about platies and such, um, she, she, the, the Platies in most fish require a strong vegetable component to their diet. And that keeps the digestion working well for them. Many people that keep a lot of these fish, particularly the Gideans, hear that they're carnivorous, so they feed them lots of carnivorous foods. Uh, you know, brine shrimp and, and uh, uh, bloodworms and, uh, you know, various, various types of heavy-duty uh, great food that the fish really like. But then they'll write me, for instance, with the dough dry, and they'll say, I've had the fish now for two months, and they don't look at nearly as colorful as they did when I first got them. Well, the vegetable component in their diet has a lot to do with not only their only all overall health, but also their color. Now, she mentions that the fish still have vibrant color, so that's good. But when you have a blockage going on intestinally, or something going on where the digestion isn't working as it should, yes, you're going to start getting poop that doesn't look right. But I don't really concern myself with the poop because it's not going to last long. If there is an obstruction, the fish is either going to pass within a couple of days or you're going to see uh, 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 some uh, bloating of the fish or you're, going to, you're certainly going to see where it stops eating and where it doesn't look good. So when you see those factors, which may even occur before the poop starts looking poor, uh, then you know there's a problem. The first thing I always do when I see bloat starting or I see some type of an intestinal blockage starting or some type of signs that things aren't going as they should is I switch them to an all vegetable flake diet. Now most of the vegetable flakes that you buy in the grocery store are not pure spirulina flake. Uh, you can get pure spirulina flake um, and it's ironically uh, more expensive than to order it with the shrimp additives and various things added. But I call the uh, green flake that has some shrimp and some other foods to balance it uh, a fortified green flake. So um, uh, I would switch to one of those. Then I might add a uh, half medicinal dose of salt. A dose of salt is one tablespoon per uh, every five gallons. Uh, I start off with a half medicinal dose of salt, which works great when you're first acclimating fish, say when you first get them to, uh, to you, particularly if they're showing clamp fins or shimmying or whatever. Um, and then if uh, I'll add a half dose of the salt, and if they show improvement within 24 hours, great. Uh, and that rarely bothers the plants. Um, but if they don't show improvement within 24 hours, then I'll add the other half of the medicinal dose of salt. In this case, when I saw that the fish were not eating uh, appropriately, or I had reason to believe they were not, uh, then I would add a half medicinal dose, dose of salt and see if things improved. But in her case, her fish weren't looking sick, um, so I probably wouldn't add it. And she was just basing it on the fact that, that, the, that the poop didn't look good. So um, uh, in her case, what I advised her to do 
was to make sure that she's feeding at least a, uh, a half of her food, of her dry food, being a spirulina-based uh, vegetable food, and that she hold back on the amount of carnivorous foods that she's feeding, and that she also feed regularly, certainly at least once a day, and if possible at the same time each day. Uh, the fish, are, the fish across the board are really big on consistency. If, uh, if things are consistent and they're the same, they do great. When they run into problems is when you start uh, varying feeding times, temperatures, whatever. Um, those are the kinds of things that trigger uh, the immune system to have to kick in and work a little extra. Little extra. And if the fish isn't particularly healthy or it's having any issues at all, uh, then those kinds of opportunistic uh, problems start to come up. So uh, in her case, I think the diet was, was primarily what she was dealing with. Uh, so. Anyway, she w I went ahead and made those changes, and she wrote me a couple weeks later to say that things were going great, and I haven't heard back. So I'm assuming that that turned the problem around. Now, based on her email and her thought process before she wrote me, there's another issue to be addressed here. She was assuming, based on the treatments she, she was choosing, that there, was in, that there were internal parasites uh, in the fish, and that that was the cause of the problem. The problem is that internal parasites are really, really rare, uh, and you're not going to get them unless you introduce them to your tank. Now, if you're going out in your backyard and collecting dace and chubs and putting them in your tank, then, you know, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. But generally, you don't see internal parasites or parasites of any nature in the pet trade, very rarely, where you're going to bring home a parasite from the pet shop. However, if you get fish from a friend, that's always a possibility, but... Still, it seems to be the, the, the first route that many people think, and I do the same thing. I mean, I've, I've bought clout many times in my life uh, for just about every case of bloat when all I needed to do was stop the rich carnivorous diet I was feeding and introduce more flake. Um, but uh, the, the assumption that there's a parasite or that that's the problem uh, is generally not the first one you should go to. Uh, alter, making sure your diet is correct, making sure that your fish are, are behaving as they should when all the other variables in the tank are correct uh, is, is, is the best route to go before deciding to spend money on medications to treat uh, parasites that, that you don't know what they are and they probably don't exist. As many of you know, I've been selling the Levamisol medication here for about 10 years and I do get quite a few uh, questions about it, so I was going to deal with a couple of them today. Jackie writes, My Levamisol arrived yesterday and it's working great against these nasty Camelanus worms. I'm doing the second treatment right now, and I'm noticing my thick-lipped Sunset Garami is eating the worms as they fall out of my guppies. Is this okay, or is he reinfecting himself by doing this? Um, my understanding is that when the fish, a fish does that, uh, first off, the levamisol wipes out the camelanus worms pretty, pretty uh, completely and kills them pretty immediately. Um, some people have said that they think that the levamisol will sometimes just stun the worms, and I guess that's possible if, you, if your dosage is incorrect, but usually it's pretty good about wiping them out. So when another fish eats the worms like that, it's not like they're reinfecting themselves. I believe it just becomes food and they digest it. Um, I've never had anybody that has written me about this, and I've discussed this with a couple people, ever say that, they, uh, that the worms reinfected the fish that were eating them. So um, I don't think that that's a, a concern. Unail writes, I've also been using the same net for all my tanks, so I'm guessing they will all be infected by now. Should I treat all the tanks with levamisol, even the ones with babies? So uh, uh, the main things that the levamisol treats, the uh, live bear disease and the camelanus worms, they, they spread through your tanks very easily. And uh, so the main means of transmission are by nets and on your hands, when your hands get wet and you move them from tank to tank. So uh, you would definitely want to treat all your tanks in your fish room if you have an infection going on in some part of the, uh, some part of the room. Uh, Erica writes, a quick question if you have the time. I just treated a couple of my juvenile guppy tanks with meds, erythromycin, ICX, and Paracleanse about a week ago, and did two 25% water changes over the weekend. How long do you think I should wait before treating the tanks with levamisol? 
I really don't know how levamisole mixes with other medications. I use it here with salt occasionally. But my basic rule is that I try not to mix medications uh, whenever possible. In other words, I, I wouldn't set out to put two medications in a tank at the same time. So if I had to dose with the levamisole and I had something else going on, I would probably wait a week before I dosed with the levamisole. And then when the levamisole second treatment is completed, I would wait at least another week before treating with something else. Um, that way you're not running into any issues where there's where the possibility that uh, an interaction with another medication might not be positive for your tank. Um, then Jess writes, I just bought some levamisole from you about six weeks ago. I'm pretty sure my guppies have parasites. I want to see what the best way to treat them will be. Is it safe for the fry or should I remove them to a hospital tank and treat my guppy tank with adults only in it? The fry are anywhere from three months to five days old. Um, I have not found that the levamisole really bothers uh, any fish. Sometimes when they're treated, uh, some of the fish, like I've had this happen with the tiger limias, where they'll sit on the bottom for about a half hour uh, as they adjust to the medication being in their water. Many fish don't show any response at all. Um, and I've never had a problem with uh, my neocaridina shrimp or snails or young fry with the levamisole. So um, I'm assuming that as long as your dosage is, is my recommendation, um, that, uh, uh, which is not very strong, uh, that there shouldn't be any issue with fry. And lastly, Barb writes, can you do a video about the levamisole and what it treats? Well, Barb, I think I can. For anyone that has kept live bearers, we have probably had fish that look like this. I apologize for the poor photo quality, but you can recognize that distinctive body shape. When seeing this, we probably all assumed that we aren't taking proper care of them or that live bearers were harder to keep than we thought. In fact, there is a microorganism that lives in the water and attaches to the sides of the fish, feeding off of the fish's fluids. The fish continues to eat, but gradually thins down and eventually loses the battle. Levamisole does an excellent job of treating this organism, and most fish can be saved when dosed as soon as the condition is noticed. Fish that are in particularly bad shape may not recover, but you will definitely see an immediate improvement in their behavior following treatment, and a turnaround of the fish in the tank over the following one to two weeks after treatment. Levamisole is also excellent for eradicating the camelanus worm, and these can be easily diagnosed as the worms that will protrude from the vent of a fish when it is infected. The levamisole can also be effective against other smaller parasites, but its scope is limited, and where it will do an excellent job with one type of organism, it may be entirely ineffective against another. For example, it will knock back planaria, but does not eradicate them, and I have experimented with it on more than one occasion with repeated doses at various concentrations without success. Camelinus worms can be seen protruding from the vent of this angelfish. The infection is not immediately fatal, and you will have some time to treat the fish to remove the worms. Levamisole will kill the worms immediately, and as with any other treatment, where a number of organisms are killed, you will want to siphon clean the bottom of the tank an hour or so following treatment to remove any dead material and prevent any water quality deterioration. The dosage that I recommend is the concentration used in the liquid versions available that can be purchased from aquaculture pharmaceutical companies. One gram, approximately one quarter teaspoon, will dose a 100 gallon tank once. A treatment is two doses 24 hours apart each preceded by a 25% water change. I usually leave the levamisole in the water following treatment and allow upcoming water changes to remove the remaining drug from the aquarium, but you could certainly perform a 25% water change 48 hours after the second dose. To avoid splitting up a quarter teaspoon of levamisole with a razor blade on a coffee saucer into 10 equal piles, each that will dose a 10 gallon tank, a levamisol measuring spoon was created by Select Aquatics where one end is measured to dose a 10 gallon aquarium and the other end is measured to dose a 15 gallon aquarium. So a 55 gallon aquarium would then be three 15s and a 10. Some will use the levamisol when they are quarantining fish and the fish tolerate the levamisol treatment well. You may see some reaction in that the fish may sit on the bottom for the first half hour or so following treatment 
but most do not show any reaction at all. I will start off this next section by saying that I have never hybridized anything myself. Um, I did sell a fish here the first couple of years of Select Aquatics that was a, uh, a red Helleri crossed with a Zephophorus Maii, which was led to a very robust, very large red Helleri, red Helleri in appearance fish. Um, and it was an effort to get toward some of the six inch fish that, I, that everyone was looking for uh, that supposedly existed in the 1960s. Um, I carried them for about two years and because I really do uh, try to focus on maintaining only pure species and never even crossing populations, uh, I eventually uh, uh, let them sell out and, and didn't continue carrying them. Um, so uh, I maintain everything really strictly separately here and I do do a lot of selective breeding and have for the last uh, about 30 years, but I've never outcrossed or uh, 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 crossed any of the things I've wor been working with. Um, primarily because the amount of variation that you will get when working with, with, a, with, with a single species to me has been so great that I haven't needed to do any outcrossing. Also, when you outcross, you're taking your program back to square one because you're going to have three or four generations uh, to get through before what you're looking for becomes consistent when you scramble your genetics by, by outcrossing to something else. So I carefully line breed everything um, and I also discuss quite a bit uh, in, in the new website app I've got coming up about inbreeding. Uh, inbreeding is, is not an unhealthy thing. Um, within the first two or three generations you will see errant traits in uh, uh, being thrown such as bent spines, or various other uh, types of things, missing fins, but they usually will pass, well they don't usually, they will always pass by the fourth generation, and uh, then you end up with a line that uh, becomes more homogenous over time. Whenever you go into any pet shop and you see rows of, say, Sunset Variatus platys that are all identical, it's because they've been inbred to where they're all fairly homogenous genetically. You know. Uh, Yes, they, they might all be vulnerable to certain diseases because they are so genetically homogenous and it's not the best idea if you're going to release that population into the wild, but the practice of line breeding to that, to that degree is, is routine in the hobby. So, so my lines here have been bred for 15, 20, uh, I think the longest, the one I have here now that's probably been here the longest is, uh, would be the fursidens, and I've been breeding them selectively since 2004. Although I have other species here, such as the tiger limia, that's been here since they were first collected in, in 2000. They were collected in 1999, and I got them from Dominic uh, in 2000. Um, and so they have, they're fairly homogenous, simply because they've been colony bred for so long. But uh, otherwise, I, I, I don't uh, uh, hybridize anything or cross anything. So the narrative you're going to be hearing against this video uh, is what Paul wrote me as to what he was doing. So when he refers throughout the video, I then did this and I then did that, of course he is the one that's speaking, it's not me. So uh, anyway, uh, he came up with some really interesting looking fish and, and I hope you enjoy it. In the video attached are the parents of my current brood. The female had never been exposed to a male guppy. When the guppy reached three months old, I added the male molly and they began mating. A bit over five weeks later, the guppy gave birth to 11 fry. Nothing is known of the color or appearance of the male guppies of the line of the female. I have found it easy to get male guppies to mate with female mollies. Getting male mollies to mate with female guppies is not very easy. I used to have to try out several males before I found the right one. I also try to find smaller male models for best odds at success. These hybrids will be three weeks old in a couple days. They are starting to look a bit more molly-like, having started out looking more like guppies, and they vary a bit in size as well. Here is a video showing some of the hybrid fry at six weeks old. I've never had so many hybrids at one time. With over two dozen fish, there should be more chance for some to stand out with interesting markings. And these hybrid fry are from two broods born over three and a half weeks apart. All of the fish in this video are two-month-old guppy molly hybrid siblings. They vary quite a bit in color, size, and markings. The black molly is their father. When crossing distantly related fish, you will get a wide range of markings and colors, 
and your choice of the best future breeders at this point is important. However, we know that in this case, these fish will likely be sterile. This fish shows what some of these hybrids will look like, and this individual shows the strong pseudoid striping that's so often seen on wild fish and is still not showing much color. When assessing the color, it's always nice to see blue, but blue has more to do with scale angle and light reflection than true blue coloration. You can still breed for the blue, but it's not as easy to control as many other colors are. This hybrid looks to be very hardy and robust, and their final look should be fairly attractive. All of the fish in this video are the hybrids born from a guppy mother and a black molly father. Like many of my past hybrids, they look very molly-like. I'm glad I used a guppy as the mother, which removes all doubt of their hybrid origin despite their appearance. Here's a brief video of one of my hybrids courting a female guppy. As you can see, the hybrid is very molly-like, and if I didn't know for sure its mother was a guppy, I would assume it was just a generic domestic black molly. I find it interesting that the molly uses both guppy backward shimmying and molly spread dorsal circling courtship techniques. Both of these females had broods, but the duller female had rather plain looking offspring. The dark fish are hybrids from a previous year. They have really colored up and are now a bit over a year and a half old. The black fish are also molly guppy hybrids from two and a half years ago of different parentage. All are male. One thing I find interesting is the concept of hybrid vigor. Even though my hybrids are sterile and in some cases show hermaphrodism, they are very healthy and long lived. My black one is soon to be four and I've never had live bearers live that long for me before. These fish look like nothing in nature. Initially, with the cross of the guppy and the molly, they cannot be reproduced. Their value comes down to the pictures and videos we're able to take of them while they are alive. Well, it's getting to be spring again, and because I have one wall of the fish room that's all windows, the fish have always bred seasonally at Select Aquatics. So it's interesting because it changes with each species as to where in the world they came from. So, for instance, my plecos will start breeding in November and December, uh, most of the Gadeas will start toward December, January, and then pick up by February into early uh, to late spring. Uh, this year, for some reason, the Iliadon fursidens uh, bred uh, started breeding around November. Now, my fursidens are one of my favorite fish. I've had them and have been selectively breeding them since about 2006, 2005, I guess. And uh, I started noticing yellow bellies and so this this kind of the, the markings and such, and I thought, you know, could they're, they're known as the trout gudeid. Could you actually breed them to look more like little trout? Well, in the last couple generations, they've gotten really exciting, where there's lots, there's a full blue sheen over their bodies, bright yellow bellies, some yellow finnage, and so it's been it's it's been very uh, exciting to see where those are going. But I had an equipment malfunction about uh, about a year and a half ago now, and I lost the majority of my adults but I had all of the young coming up. So anyway, um, when that happened, I went ahead and allowed everything I had to just breed as much as possible. They've been here for 15 years, so uh, the, uh, my not calling for undesirable traits isn't going to deteriorate the line all that much. So I have to pull, what happens here with all my species, but I need to do this with the fursidens, is to pull all the fish, look at every one, pull the ones that don't meet the standards that uh, I normally try to hold to, um, and then pick the best breeders for the next generation. So, with the next video, I'm gonna that's gonna be one of the segments is going through that process with the first events. I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and I look forward to seeing you next time in about another month or so. Um, following that, I do have to sort then through the green dragons for long versus short finish, color, and overall finish, and so that will be done as well in upcoming videos. Take care.